So welcome to the American Ornithological Society's Community Congress on English Bird Names. My name is Amelia Julia Demery, and I am a member of the AOIS Diversity and Inclusion Committee. All right, let's get the slide sharing. Perfect, perfect. This event is hosted by a subset of the committee's members, shown here. We want to welcome our AOS members and all members of the bird watching and ornithological community to this Congress about a topic we all interact with, bird names. In this event, we create a space for different users of bird names to express their perspectives on what it means to change the name of a bird focusing on English common names and eponyms, or species names that honor people. Uh, next slide, please. We are approaching this event with the following goals. One, to increase awareness of the challenges and opportunities around English bird names, especially eponyms. Two, to hear perspectives from diverse stakeholders across the ornithological and birdwatching community. And three, to inform next steps to address the issue. So the DNI subcommittee designed the event with these goals in mind, and we are excited to hear from our invited panelists to help us achieve them. Through its advancement of scientific knowledge and conservation of birds, the AOS serves a broad and global ornithological community, which includes the more than 3,000 AOS members from around the world. We are listening to this broad community as your voices and engagement with bird names inspired us to hold this event. Further. AOS leadership and members of various checklist committees, including the North American Classification Committee, are in the audience today so that they can hear directly from you, the broader community of birders and ornithologists who care about bird names. This event will help our society develop next steps in dealing with names and other factors that might create barriers to participation in this important and far-reaching conversation. That said, we want to take the time to demonstrate that we hear the community that we are in service to. We recognize that the scheduling of this event conflicts with the Joint Association of Field Ornithologists, Wilson Ornithological Society, and Northeast Natural History Conference, putting many people in the uncomfortable position of choosing between simultaneous events. This conflict also extends to those who cannot attend because of working and school hours. Together, we acknowledge that this time frame, though it was the best for us and the panelists, was not ideal for everyone in our community. To accommodate as many community members as possible, we will be recording this event to expand access to the discussion, and we will post a publicly available recording to the AOS YouTube channel. Ultimately, we hope this event moves this important conversation about English bird names forward and helps foster future opportunities for community engagement. In that vein, we will now outline today's event. Next slide. In a moment, we will set the stage for mindfulness, outlining a success agreement for constructive discussion. We will then give an overview of how the event took shape and introduce the panel before they share their perspectives. We have asked each stakeholder group to spend three to five minutes sharing their points of view. Then we will open the floor to pre-submitted questions and questions posed in the live Q&A. We encourage all audience members to submit questions using the Zoom Q&A and upvote others' questions. You can also share your thoughts on other social media platforms using the hashtags English Bird Names and Community Congress. Next slide. We want to emphasize that we will follow the AOS Code of Conduct, which will be posted in the chat shortly. Anyone who does not follow the code, for example, by posting derogatory and or non-constructive comments in the Q&A will, oh, went too fast, thank you. Uh, let me repeat that. Anyone who does not follow the code, for example, by posting derogatory and or non-constructive comments in the Q&A will be banned from the Zoom and will not be allowed to return. Examples of derogatory include racial slurs, putting other people down due to their identities and expletives. Examples of non-constructive include questioning and or dismissing the value of any and all perspectives in this event. In light of the seriousness of this event, we want this to sink in. So again, anyone who does not follow the code of conduct will be banned from the Zoom and will not be allowed to return. All right, finally, 
We'll offer closing remarks and a request to fill out a post-event survey to evaluate the event. Next slide. Our moderator for this event is Mr. Jose Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez is a professional educator with additional experience in conservation, science, and design. As partner of the Avarna Group, which is a diversity and inclusion consulting group specializing in the outdoor and environmental sectors, Mr. Gonzalez develops resources like learning experiences and strategic planning, which makes him well poised to guide us in this complex conversation. In fact, he was just honored last week by the Bay Nature Institute and their local hero awards as their 2021 community hero. Thank you so much, Amelia. I believe that's my cue um, to say hello. And then also, uh, I believe the next slide is coming up. So I want to say thank you, and I am grateful to be here with all of you. I have the opportunity um, to help moderate and facilitate part of this conversation today. And so I'll start with a couple of things before uh, turning it back over to our organizers. <clears throat> I put this up here in terms of uh, success orientations um, as reminders in two fronts. The first one is I have these noted here in terms of soft on the people, hard on the problem, fixed on the goals, flexible on the needs actually a nice uh, phrase that works well as a handshake as well um, to remember that often through as we nav navigate through differences of opinions and including tension and conflict this can be helpful in terms of assessing how much we are aligned and being able uh, to work together on a cooperative and collaborative um, concern and issue we have these as, as examples in terms of how we can model this and by listening attentively rather than predatorily uh, affirming in terms of letting others know that we are, uh, we are hearing what is being said, responding directly in terms of being also being able to know what concerns and questions are being raised, um, asking questions that help um, in terms of adding additional information and clarifying and confirming certain statements and points, and expressing interest compared to positions or opinions. Of course, positions and opinions continue to will play, do play a role <laughs> and we are welcome to have opinions. Uh, although there is a difference between being able to ask to be able to better understand. And we're putting in this because um, I had actually recently been uh, sharing on social media about this notion of high conflict. And the idea by high conflict is that I'll close by saying this part to say that what we are going to be modeling and practicing today actually in, can support a lot of quote unquote good conflict or being able to um, navigate a space that doesn't default uh, to high conflict, which tends to end up um, resulting in a lot of unpro unproductive uh, work. And I'll close by saying these kind of five components that I think are really helpful that all the panelists and everybody here has agreed to show up in this place. The first one is that we are investigating the understory, so to speak. So we're here to be able to ask um, and navigate these questions. We're also looking at how we can reduce the binary to be able to understand that there may be more values and interests aligned with each other than we may realize. Uh, we're paying attention on, on how um, we ensure that we're listening to each other rather than supporting uh, fire starting or kind of just get the thrill of the fight. Uh, and then we're making the time and space to be able to approach this through these different considerations because there is a complication of the narrative that doesn't rely on just quote unquote pure heroes or cartoonish villains. And I think this is the component that I'm really excited to be able to be in this part and, and support in my own role. And of course, as a novice birder. So with that, I'll keep coming back to these and understanding that I will be playing my role with this type of support and orientation. And I am looking forward um, to be able to, to, to do this and excited to be here. So with that, I will pass it over back to our organizers. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jose. Now, here is DNI committee member, Irene Liu, to tell the story of how this event came to be. Irene.
Sorry about that. I realized I was muted, so I'll start over. We want to credit Dr. Drew Lanham with the idea for the Community Congress. During a conversation in summer 2020, he suggested an event where we could, quote, fully discuss the issue without knee-jerk reactions. The DNI committee understood that we could play a role in ensuring many voices could be heard in this discussion. So from September to November 2020, we conducted 11 listening sessions with 38 people and also attended two seminars on the topic. We wanted to hear the values, priorities, concerns, and ideas of groups across our community. Our sample size of stakeholders came from people we reached out to on our own, people recommended by the AOS Executive Committee and NACC, and people recommended to us during our calls with stakeholders. For transparency, three groups and three individuals declined to participate or did not reply. Next slide, please. So what you're, what you're about to see on the slide is the list of stakeholders whom we did speak with or listen to about bird names. As you can see, we co contacted individuals and groups with broad constituencies in the research, birding, conservation, and data management fields. We talked to people across AOS, people in charge of other checklists, the USGS Bird Banding Lab and Breeding Bird Survey, the Fish and Wildlife Division of Migratory Birds, Bird Names for Birds, the National Audubon Society, Birds Canada, Field Guide authors Ken Kaufman and David Sibley, and the American Birding Association. As mentioned, we also attended two seminars. The Feminist Bird Club hosted webinar on eponymous bird names, and the Toronto Public Library hosted webinar on decolonizing bird names. And we were able to speak with the presenters of this last seminar as well. And in the next slide, we've just quickly highlighted the individuals and groups who are on the panel today. With each of these stakeholders, we had a Zoom call where we covered the following topics on the next slide, although we didn't address every topic in every call. These topics included thoughts on bird names, especially eponyms, the cost of changing versus not changing names, how stakeholders have dealt with name changes in the past during their work, how to coordinate name, coordinate name changes within the scope of each stakeholder's work, how to identify names that should be changed, how to identify and assess alternate names, and how to uphold equity and inclusion in, the, in these steps, and anticipated responses from stakeholder audiences. We closed by asking stakeholders how they envisioned a successful community Congress and whether they would be interested in participating. We are both humbled and privileged that leaders in the community are sharing their thoughts with us today. We are also aware that the panel does not have an especially diverse composition in regards to racial and ethnic representation. Our final panelist composition thus partially reflects the asymmetric racial and ethnic representation in our field, and it also reflects how efforts like these tend to demand disproportionate time and labor from underrepresented groups, making it difficult to recruit already overburdened participants. We are also aware that any event cannot be a complete representation of the entire community's viewpoints, which is another reason we see this community Congress as a catalyst for further dialogue. All right, thank you so much, Irene. All right, so as we turn off um, our slide share, I'm going to turn it back to Jose to introduce our panelists today. Jose. Thank you so much, Amelia. Great, so um, that was a bit of kind of the framing uh, and setup. So I'll add a few more words before I share a little bit about our panelists. Um, the first one is, um, it's an important recognition and mindfulness reminder that a lot has been happening this week. Um, everything from the wake um, uh, of, of, of the trial and then um, other um, spaces of trauma and harm this week and over the past uh, months and beyond. So it's important to recognize that many are in this space um, with different considerations uh, and different effects on our participation. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. And then also in addition to that, we are still in these, in these types of spaces. So I'll remind each other to kind of, we'll continue to be kind of considerate and, and, um, and gentle with ourselves in terms of we might have uh, loved ones, uh, pets uh, or other significant um, you know, family members wander into your Zoom, that's quite okay. If, if people need to step out, that's totally okay as well. So just wanna make some of these notes. And then lastly, in, in that regard, is that as we hear from each other, that it's important to stress that component that was just shared. This is one of many steps 
Um, and just as much as we're recognizing how much there's still to do um, and what types of individuals and voices are not present here, it is not done through that intention and consideration of exclusion. And so the work will continue to be mindful of that to be able to how to continue to, to, to work on this and continue to do this better uh, while, ignoring, while ensuring that that doesn't mean that we can't do any of the work uh, because of a care or concern um, due to perfectionism. So I really wanna stress that. So with that, I wanna kind of note a little bit about um, our panelists. In addition, it's important to acknowledge that, uh, you know, we, I myself am calling you all from ancestral traditional stolen and unceded land of the Nisenan, uh, Maidu, uh, and Miwok, among many others, in what is present day Sacramento. And that that plays a role both not just in the acknowledgement and the statement, but the ongoing work that we do on, on this. Um, and then, of course, that we are much of what we uh, share as well comes within different privilege frameworks, even the fact that we're choosing English common bird names operating our Western European centric framework. So just acknowledging because a lot of this is present, even if sometimes um, we don't take the time to state it. It is my pleasure uh, as well to introduce all the panelists for this event. As I introduce each panelist, I'm inviting each panelist to please turn on their video and leave it on until I finish the introductions. I'm gonna do this in alphabetical order by last name. Uh, and I'm just as fallible as all of you. So as if and how I make a mistake, <laughs> please note that. Um, and I invite any panelists to of course um, correct me um, uh, with any mistakes that I make. So first off, uh, Jody Allaire is the Director of Citizen Science and Community Engagement at Birds Canada and the co-editor of Birdwatch Canada Magazine. Jody is a birder and naturalist who delivers outreach programs to audiences across Canada and has written numerous articles on birds, birding, and connecting with nature. So welcome, Jody. Yusuf uh, Atia is a lifelong birder, ecologist, and natural history tour leader based out of British Columbia's Canada. He coordinates and supports national citizen science programs at Birds Canada. Welcome, Yusuf. Uh, Danny. Bystrak is a biologist at the USGS Bird Banding Lab since 1984, working in both the banding and encounter science, which involves data integrity of the incoming 1.2 million banding records each year, wrestling with banders over errors and other problems, and cleaning up thousands of questionable records from the previously unfiltered historical data. Welcome, Danny. Uh, Jeffrey Gordon. Um, is the president of the American Birding Association, a position he has held since 2010. Jeff started birding at the age of 12, and there's very little about birds, birding and birding sites that he doesn't find fascinating, though he's especially interested in birding culture and the many ways we all communicate and share our passion for birds. Welcome, uh, Jeff. Uh, Gregoria Hartman, who will be joining us during the Q&A portion of the event, is a lifelong birder and currently serves as the Network Action Manager for the National, National Audubon Society, uh, where Z works with Audubon at networks of 450 traditional chapters stretching from Guam to Washington, DC. Welcome, Gregoria. Uh, Marshall uh, Eilith has long been interested in coordinating bird watchers to try to put their sightings to good use for science and increased understanding of birds and the natural world. He currently manages the eBird project with a particular focus on data quality and review of eBird scientific output. He also helps coordinate the eBird Clements taxonomy and its integration into Cornell Lab resources. So welcome, Marshall. Kathy Jones is the volunteer manager for Birds Canada Ontario program, uh, Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program, and the Canadian Lakes Loon Survey. She has worked in citizen science programming and in engaging community members in bird research and conservation since 1995. Welcome, Kathy. Next is Ken Kaufman, who is a freelance naturalist and the author of 13 books, including the Kaufman Field Guide to Birds of North America and the Guía de Campo Kaufman a las Aves de Norte América. He is a fellow of the AOS and a former member of the ABA Checklist Committee. Welcome, Ken. 
And then Jeff LeBaron is a lifelong birder who grew up in New England and New Mexico, who is passionate about all things that fly, walk, or crawl. As director of the Audubon Christmas Bird Count since 1987, he shepherded the evolution of the program from being 100% paper-based to 100% online, including the creation of the 120-year 20 20-year 20 CBC database. Birds and the names they are given are extremely important to him, both personally and professionally. Welcome, Jeff. And next, uh, Dennis, uh, excuse me, Denis Lepage uh, will be joining us late, although I believe they, they're already here, and is Senior Director, Data Science and Technologies at Birds Canada. I'm here, Jose. Hi. Welcome. He is the lead on eBird Canada, breeding bird atlases, nature counts, and the MODIS wildlife tracking system. He also manages the website at the base as a personal project and is also involved in several global tex uh, taxonomic efforts, including the International Ornithologist Union Working Group Avian Checklist. So welcome in. And David Sibley is a lifelong birder who has lived through many changes in species names. He is the author and illustrator of the Sibley Guides series of books. Welcome, David. Uh, and uh, nearing our end, we have Dave Solkowski, who is the program ornithologist for the North American Breeding Bird Survey, uh, BBS, where he works with thousands of citizen scientists annually and manages the over 90 million record BBS database. He has been actively involved in wildlife research for over 30 years, both in the US and abroad, and has worked on, a myri on myriad topics spanning the fields of ecology, evolutionary biology, biogeography, toxicology, and population monitoring. So welcome, Dave. And then last, um, but as well as always, definitely not least, we have Bird Names for Birds, uh, that is, uh, which is organized by Jordan Rudder, Gabriel Foley, Alex Holt, and Jess McLaughlin. Jordan, Gabriel, and Alex are here today to represent the core team behind the historical biographies and communications of this grassroots initiative to remove um, eponymous bird names. So first of all, just a quick pause to say again, Thank you to all, glad that you're here. Um, and we'll move right now to hear a little bit from all of you, though I wanna just uh, acknowledge that we have a, a great a kind of robust <laughs> grouping of panelists um, and that will influence how we'll move into the questions. So we group the panelists roughly by field and um, each one will get uh, some time to basically get to express a little bit in terms of um, some of the space that you're coming from, obviously some of the expertise and approaches to kind of uh, this question and, and, and issues that we have at hand. Uh, we're asking everybody to of course be mindful of time, be pithy, um, and then just kind of like be considerate of that time in terms of other panelists while making sure that, um, that if you have those key points, <laughs> don't hesitate in sharing them. So we grouped everybody here roughly by field, and I will be calling on, 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 on the people kind of to come in and, and share your, 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 uh, your points. And then know that this is just the start of the conversation because after that, we'll be able to move into Q&A. Excellent. And so Jeff uh, LeBaron, uh, if you don't mind, um, would you like to begin? Well, thank you, Jose. Um, and thanks very much to the AOSD and I committee for sort of putting this whole thing together. I think it's a really important and wonderful conversation that we're uh, having at this point. Um, my career, I've been a birder forever. Some of my earliest memories that actually involve birds, especially things like rose-breasted grosbeaks and common loon and bobolinks. So some, as you can see, I'm uh, Eastern based, at, you know, when I was young and then uh, now currently I'm in Western Massachusetts. Um, for after graduate school, I, I actually did overwater aerial survey work for a long time, but then ended up uh, working at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, where I was the collection manager for uh, Virio, which at the time was the largest collection of photographs of birds in the world. Uh, at that point is really when I became very much involved with bird names, especially more than just the birds themselves. It was very important for us to catalog all the photographs that we had. Um, and it was birds of the world, not just of North America, but still uh, the bird names were one of the key things that we were working with. Um, in 1987, when I started being, uh, became in charge of the Christmas bird count, um, clearly 
bird names are very important to the, the community of CBC people. Um, and it, it was really, uh, it's become a, a very interesting phenomenon and process to, to manage the CBC database as well as the you know, 50 to 80,000 people that do the CBC, many of whom have pretty strong ideas about the way we should do things and also the way what bird names are. Um, I'm realizing that um, as you know, part of a, a conservation organization, the National Audubon Society, um, we need to recognize that um, birding and ornithology and the interest in conservation and the outdoors needs to expand beyond our current audience. Um, as is quite apparent from you know, the, the panel members here, I was also vice president and program chair for Hampshire Bird Club here in Western Massachusetts. And we are, our groups, our profession is predominantly older, white, and less so, but still predominantly male. Um, the, the future of conservation really uh, depends on engaging other audiences. And I think, um, you know, we don't want to go willy nilly about changing bird names, but uh, we do need to be aware that there are situations or can be situations where the bird names seem uh, alien or uh, could be a, a uh, an uh, impediment for people to, to actually become much more interested in birds. So um, that sort of combination of my uh, background and my feelings on it. Um, the other thing I will say is that I think no matter what the AOS and um, all of us decide, um, people are gonna call birds by the, the names that they want to. I still know that half the people that I talk to when I see a, an oriole locally, it's, to them it's a Northern Oriole. And everybody almost still says Rufus sided Tohi. So we're not gonna change what everybody says um, in their general usage, but I think um, what we do have is an opportunity to help um, move, move the, the game forward in terms of being a more welcoming uh, field and um, hobby. So thanks very much. And I'm very glad to be here and I'll be a part of this. Thank you so much, Jeff. Really appreciate that. Um, next up, we have our wonderful group of Birds Canada. So we have Yusuf, uh, Kathy, Jody, and Denny. Um, we'll open it up to, to all of you to be able to share collective and respective points. Um, and Yusuf, if you'd like to begin and then just like, um, uh, we'll have other members please add, add in as well. Uh, thank you, Jose. Uh, personally, um, I recognize that eponyms can create barriers to the inclusion of some members of society, especially marginalized groups. And uh, changing them is in the best interest of birding and conservation in the long run. Um, I just don't see why we would want anyone to feel excluded, uh, birds and the environment are, uh, need all the help they can get. And um, social justice issues aside, eponyms for me lack in creativity and they just do nothing to engage uh, people who are new to birding or citizen science. And uh, they, they don't tell you anything about a bird's appearance, its life history, uh, it makes it more difficult to relate to them and to remember uh, the bird names. And uh, one other important aspect, I believe, is that the current process for naming needs to be reassessed. Um, I think a deciding body should include diverse stakeholders that are informed on inclusion and equity, in addition to taxonomy and, and life history birds. And there's an opportunity here to create a transparent process uh, that can be a model used for other languages, other parts of the world, um, for dealing with eponyms going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll open it up to others. So if it's if it helps, um, Kathy. You're on mute, Kathy. Hi, everyone. Um, first off, I think this is an important subject. And I want to thank the AOS for inviting me to this community Congress. Um, I'm going to read my notes just so that I don't miss any points. I would also like to acknowledge that I come from a background of citizen science management, as well as citizen science engagement. In my opinion, bird names really need to be relatable and, and inclusive to all members of society. Epidemic and honorific name 
create barriers um, to the larger birding community and prevent their engagement in of many members of society to the joy of birds. And that's an absolute necessary to increase conservation of all these important species. Um, they also provide inappropriate recognition for socially unacceptable views and actions. And language changes through time. So it is reasonable to reflect that language and bird names and any name is going to change to match the society and the culture of the day. Um, what I would really like to see is end up with a stable process to move forward so that this is a consistent and standardized framework that we use for renaming bird names uh, and that it uses members from that are well versed in a lot of the important aspects, including diversity, inclusion, natural history and taxonomy. And just within some recent conversations that I've had, um, I would like to see us actually really look at other languages such as the French and the Spanish nomenclature. And maybe there's insight that we can use from them to build more relatable bird names that are still taxonomically appropriate. Um, and hopefully we will end up with a really good working framework from this process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Really appreciate that. Um, uh, Jody? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I want to start off just really echoing, you know, I, I fully support my, my colleagues and friends, Yusuf and Kathy and their perspective on this. And I do want to add, you know, one key point that I think is important to mention here, especially dealing with French, is that French is actually an official language in Canada. Um, and I think uh, having to deal what we need to also consider French names in Canada when we're looking at uh, common name usage in, in North America. So I think that's an important point I just want to lay out. Uh, I want to take a second really to acknowledge the AOS Diversity and Inclusion Committee for hosting this event uh, and for doing all that work, uh, gathering input from stakeholders. I also want to take a second of my time to publicly acknowledge Jordan Rudder and Gabriel Foley and the work of Bird Names for Birds. You know, it is their dedication to this issue is the reason that we're all here right now. Uh, and I think that's important. So uh, the last, I'll just really end off by just saying a couple of things, you know, in terms of my perspective, I think words matter. I think names really matter. I think the changes that being discussed and considered here today, uh, you know, these are not changes for the sake of change, right? These are changes that reflect in evolving societal views and perspectives. I also think there's a real conservation opportunity here. Um, there, there is a big opportunity here. You know, I've spent my life trying to engage people in the joys of birding and the importance of monitoring and protecting bird populations. And I feel that the more barriers we can remove to broad public engagement, the better it will be for birds. Uh, so I'm gonna end with that and hopefully we'll get a chance to discuss more of that later. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, and then next, uh, Denny. Hi. Um, so I'll echo, uh, thank you for having me. I think I'll echo some of the notes that I think Jeff has mentioned. I, I come from a place where I manage data. Uh, I manage lots of it. In some cases, we're talking about billions of records. And, and I think names, um, as was mentioned, have a, a, an important sort of societal role, uh, cultural role, but also have a, a a sort of a different role that is is very scientific so they when you try to organize names precision matter uh, so i think we need to make sure that we preserve that role and that we don't undermine it in our ability to sort of organize um, data so i think you know doing an orderly transition um, i think is important from my perspective on this and um, I, I think the other aspect um, that i should point out is uh, yes i think this is well when well done i think uh, this provides an opportunity to do uh, to be more inclusive and more uh, opening towards people and uh, have a useful discussion. But I think we need to make sure that we use this opportunity carefully and, and wisely to sort of make sure that we have that discussion and that we don't just throw new names without sort of um, having sufficient sort of consensus behind the process, at least on uh, why we're, we're taking these steps. And I, I think if we just rush too much um, without considering, you know, the Pot potential uh, opinions that people might have. It might actually turn people away from doing conservation or supporting organizations that might be behind these changes. Um, so I, I, 
I would certainly um, mostly sort of or just sort of be a bit careful about how we proceed. Um, I think some people might have strong feelings and we need to be able to listen to what they have to say. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Denis. Um, and next up, we're gonna hear from Marshall Eilif of eBird. Hi all, it's an honor to be here. A lot of great points have already been made. Um, so thanks to everyone. Um, I'd like to start at, to acknowledge at the outset the huge impact that the Bird Names for Birds movement has already had. Um, eponyms are part of every bird name discussion that's going on these days, and already multiple new species that might readily have used established eponyms just a couple years ago have been named with descriptive names. Um, so I see that as a testament to how strongly those arguments have resonated for why we should no longer name birds for people and just what a narrow demographic of ornithology has been represented in names that have been used in the past. Uh, we all agree that offensive, grossly inaccurate, and exclusionary names must change. At eBird, we receive a lot of questions about why we don't just make broad scale name changes to the eBird taxonomy instantly. And that answer is that it is precisely because we want to hear from a wide array of voices and steer towards consensus. It's really, really important that changes are made along a, a really broad coalition and consensus within the Americas and beyond. Um, eBird coordinates a global consensus taxonomy and works with partners all over the world, including the AOS and the Americas. And a major goal has been to consolidate efforts in taxonomies, um, and we must work with lots of partners to do this. So on one level, a bird name is an information retrieval system. You type a, type a name into a search engine and a whole world of resources opens up. And just where I work at the Cornell Lab, the bird name is your key to vast information resources at eBird or Merlin, and you can pull up those amazing bird models of, of bird migration from your eBird data or dive into in-depth in species accounts at Birds of the World. Locally and globally, these bird names are used for regional, national, and international laws and conservation initiatives like the IUCN Red List. And that information system can become confused or diluted when multiple names are in circulation, especially with the added complexity of species splits and lumps. In the end, we really hope to see true global agreement on the names and taxonomy for all species of birds so that field guides, national and international databases, and names used by scientists and recreational birders worldwide are consistent and well understood throughout communities and across international borders. So to change names globally and at this vast new scale will require us to work in phases, which means we'll need some smart prioritization, which I think will help to bring along a broader coalition and also to roll out these changes effectively. For example, we all saw with the long spur last year that some eponyms are more problematic than others, and that would be one important axis upon which to prioritize. Beyond those, when an eponym and descriptive name are both used for a bird on existing global, global lists, can we all just agree to use the descriptive name instead? And after those priorities, the more recently adopted names may be the easier ones to address, given their much smaller footprint in literature and ornithological consciousness. I would also hope that we consider intersectionality within these problems. Changing Bird's name for John James Audubon may well be one of the highest priorities because of Audubon's personal history. But among the two birds named for Audubon today, I'd focus on the Shearwater first because its taxonomy has been a complete hot mess for decades. So much so that even with all my warm fuzzy talk about eBird's consensus taxonomy and AOS and eBird, still can't agree on the species limits for this bird. Um, so at this point, the name Audubon Shearwater has been used to describe 11 different combinations of nine different taxa from all over the world with vastly different ranges, no consistent set of field marks, and common and scientific names have practically lost all meaning whatsoever. The population that remains has no established descriptive name, so maybe it's about time to coin Caribbean Shearwater or Gulf Stream Shearwater or something else to better reflect the bird that we type into eBird today. So even as we address the most urgent changes, let's work together to create the effective and thoughtful process we need to revise and roll out additional name changes at these new scales. Done right, an initiative to rename hundreds of birds would engage a massive and diverse community of enthusiasts from all across the globe, would dig into the essence of each species to appreciate it even more deeply and to find inspired and appropriate names. When existing names are unwelcoming, let's change them. Um, Let's also ensure a thoughtful and careful consensus-based approach that will best serve our mutual goals to make ornithology and birding inclusive and welcoming to all and to honor the birds we want to love and protect. Thanks. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Marshall. And now we have uh, a representative from USGS. So first we'll hear from you, Danny, uh, and then followed by Dave. Thank you, Jose. Um, in the bird banding lab, we're a lot more focused than, than uh, Marshall is, mostly just North America. Um, <clears throat> but we, um, we do have some interesting problems related to this. Like, for example, we acknowledge subspecies and superspecies, some of which are eponymous, like Buick swan, Buick uh, Audubon's warbler, Audubon's crested cara, cara sorry, cara, cara, Harlan's hawk. We also um, have banding in US territories. So Swinnow's snipe, for example, is on our list, but I didn't see it on the, on the list of species in bird names for birds. And super species like trails flycatcher, I assume that was named after someone too. And then there's secondary eponymy like the Juan Fernandez petrel, which is named after the islands, but presumably the islands were named after a person. Um, so, you know, there will be, we we'll have to dig a little deeper than just the species names if we go along with this. Bird banding lab should not have any problem with name changes because all of our data are stored as numeric um, equivalents, basically. So we just have to change one table. It'll be a minor annoyance um, to have to change those names, but once it's done, all of our data are just automatically updated. Um, also, another concern in the bird banding lab is the, the four letter codes that have become quite common around the world, or at least around North America, are rather important to the bird banding lab which is kind of where they were born actually. And um, I fear the renaming process is going to, might create more conflicts, which just confuses the issue for everybody. If we have new names along with new four letter codes to deal with, it could be a big turnoff for banders. So in that sense, I'm a little concerned about who actually will do the naming. And I'd like to, to hope that, and think that, that that would be actually considered as a reasonably important part of, uh, of the process. Um, also, we, we, haven't, we haven't needed to be particularly quick about updating names, partially because to submit banding data, banders have to use a program we call Bandit, and we have not been able to update that. So basically we're kind of stuck with the old names anyway, but uh, we do get them changed eventually. And if this actually happens, we will certainly go along with it. But uh, I don't, you know, I certainly go along with everybody's feelings on this subject. And um, personally, I can't speak for the USGS, obviously, but um, personally, I, I go along with all, all the feelings that have been expressed so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, and then Dave. Hi, Jose. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, first, I want to be sure I draw a distinction between the underlying moral issue, and I think there's broad agreement in what the issue is here and that it's complex. And second to that is the process of evaluating how well a given solution, like in this case bird names for birds, addresses the root problem. And what I'm about to say here doesn't weigh in on either of those. It's just intended to elucidate the decision landscape. So the BBS is very similar to how Danny had described the BBL. And then our database structure has unique numbers for our taxonomic concepts. And it's on those that we tack or hang the scientific and different language names. So technically speaking, making the change in a database isn't that big of a deal. But imagine that, I mean, if you imagine that you're holding a specimen in your hand, in that specimen, you have all the identification information you need. It's right there. And you also have the time and the place where that specimen was collected. But programs like the BBS, they don't collect specimens. Instead, observers use English names as a symbol in place of that identification information that you might have from a specimen. And that gets paired with a time and a place. So on the front end of the BBS, when observers are in the field conducting their rapid three minute point counts in quick succession, they're interacting with those symbols very quickly and they're making decisions about how to record their data. And then on the back end of the survey, researchers, regulators, policymakers, they all come to the BBS for data and they're using the English names to find the species data and our analytical results. 
And so with that said, for both of those, long-term continuity in the English names is important. And any changes that come um, to those English names come with a risk of disrupting the continuity. We can take measures to successfully minimize how disruptive any, say, bulk name changing events can be to the chain of continuity. But one thing we also have to be really careful to keep in mind is that the action isn't perceived as setting a new precedent for future and more frequent name changes, because that, that really could pose a more dramatic mis risk of disrupting the chain of continuity that I've just mentioned. So that's um, pretty much how the bird names for birds uh, influences the BBS. That's pretty much the, the entire sphere of it. Thank you so much, Dave. We really appreciate that. Uh, and next, we're going to hear from Jeff uh, of the American Birding Association. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Jeffrey Gordon, president of the American Birding Association. And at the ABA, we believe that a world with more birders and more birds is a better world. We believe that the biggest threat birds face isn't glass collisions or outdoor cats or even global warming as dire as those threats are. It's being ignored to death. Not enough people know and not enough people care. Our mission is to inspire all people to enjoy and protect wild birds. And our primary path to conservation is through people and community and the promotion of shared ethics and values. We're particularly interested in and committed to building a more diverse and inclusive birding community. And note that progress so far has often been frustratingly slow. Um, who we speak for. Uh, we aspire to speak to and for the birding community, to reflect and also to shape opinion. That said, today I'm not speaking for the ABA community. There's definitely a wide range of opinions out there. Um, but I do hope to speak about how this conversation about eponyms could go and offer some perhaps useful experience. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the entire ABA team, especially Nate Swick. Um, a lot of folks have contributed to our thinking and ideas about this whole process. And also uh, thanks Jose and the AOS committee and Jordan and Gabriel and Alex and the whole Bird Names for Birds uh, crew. Um, very well done. Um, our overall sense of things, there are some good reasons for keeping names as they are or modifying them only slightly, but in our opinion, there are more good reasons to drop honorifics entirely and move forward. Though we think it's important not to get too far out in front of public opinion, we think this change can and should be undertaken sooner rather than later and quickly and comprehensively rather than slowly and piecemeal. Um, we as an organization have recently been through a change that we think offers some parallels and that was adding Hawaii to the core ABA area. Um, that happened just a few years ago after almost 45 years of Hawaii not being included. And no Hawaii uh, was a status quo established at our founding, probably more randomly than pointedly and was clearly controversial. Uh, it was a perennial topic of contention, often generating more heat than light. But over several decades and following a couple of unsuccessful attempts, opinion changed and the motion to add Hawaii passed with 70% approval of our membership. I think keys to why this happened. Uh, there was respect and acknowledgement of varying viewpoints and at its best, a tendency to argue the pros of one's feelings rather than to argue against other people's uh, thoughts and values. Finally, an emphasis on human impacts rather than getting into the arcana of colonization events, and I mean the bird ones, not the people ones, um, and also patience, especially some key people, and I'll cite Peter Pyle, uh, stepping forward and projecting confidence that the change could be made fairly quickly and without a terrible and prolonged disruption. The results, um, we added Hawaii. And admittedly, Hawaii's native, native avifauna is still in big trouble. Um, I don't think changing eponyms is gonna instantly make birding as diverse and inclusive as we all want it to be. However, um, I would say I've never met a Hawaiian birder who isn't happy with the change. I would also say that everyone in the industry, 
reports more interest in travel to Hawaii uh, to enjoy its native birds. Um, Hawaii's birds are starting to be included in US and Canada field guides. And very subjectively and anecdotally, it seems that even many of those who are pretty opposed to the change now seem at least mildly in favor. So I think, I think we can do this as a community. I think we can do it in a way that's respectful um, and, and constructive and as minimally disruptive as we can do it. And we would just say, again, based on our own experience, we suggest, as others have said, bring in diverse uh, voice, voices and perspectives, change all honorifics rather than coming up with the most problematic people or whatever. Um, do it with public input, but not too much. Um, that's a fine line to walk, um, but I think it can be done. And also do it all at once. Um, better to just get it done. So, and and I'll just close by saying at the ABA, we want to help. We think this stuff is really important, as arcane as it can be, um, but we think it's really significant. Uh, we want it to go well, and we want it to be a credit to this community. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Really appreciate that. And next, we're going to hear from Bird Names Birds. I know we have Gabriel, Alex, and Jordan. And I understand, Jordan, you will be um, speaking for the group. Yeah, thanks so much. So Bird Names for Birds is a grassroots initiative advocating for the removal of hominous common bird names and a review of the nomenclatural system to aid in decolonizing birding and ornithology and make it more welcoming and inclusive. Christian Cooper's experience in Central Park brought social justice issues to the forefront of the birding community, not because it was a new issue, but because it was one we could no longer ignore or not react to. So Gabriel and I spoke up about bird names in June of 2020 and how eponymous names don't reflect the welcoming inclusive community we know that birding can be. And as a community, we have an incredible opportunity ahead of us that could truly unite every bird community member. Birds are what link our community together, and it is through their names that we communicate our connection, whether we are ornithologists, birders, or the general public just enjoying birds in their everyday life. We have the opportunity to include everyone, no matter who they are, as we move forward. This is our chance to include Indigenous people and Canadians and Mexicans and Jamaicans and everyone else impacted by these birds we all share. We can include young birders and ornithology students, and we can acknowledge in a concrete way the harm the colonialism that supported ornithology has had and take one small step towards repairing that harm. We have the opportunity to help put everyone at the same starting line because someone who has been looking at birds for 80 years will be learning these new names the same time in the same way that a person just discovering the magic of birds will. And as we all learn those new names, we can share about the threats those birds face or their conservation needs. What if we could inspire the next generation and create a ripple effect of people who care about birds and even have a bird focused career? And we can also actually teach this history, not erase or ignore or forget about it. We should shine a spotlight on our past and use it to show how we got here and why we're not going to carry on this way. We don't need to airbrush myths of so-called great men enshrined in our everyday vocabulary. We need the true histories, good and bad, laid out for all so that we may learn from them. The changes must be all encompassing. Every eponymous common name needs, <laughs> needs to go. We know that won't happen quickly and to be done right, it shouldn't happen quickly, at least not overnight, but it needs to happen. The unique traits of each bird deserve to be celebrated rather than an eternal memorial to the moment they were first collected. However, Bird Names for Birds has been adamant about not proposing alternative names or solutions itself, because for true success and forward movement, those elements should be of, by, and for the community. Without addressing the system that encouraged and perpetuated eponyms, the literal name changes will just be window dressing. But we can do this. I know we can, because we can be leaders in a way I don't think we ever realized in the bird community. There are 149 species with eponymous names in North America from Canada to Panama. Changing all of them seems like a monumental task, but it appears much smaller when you recall the 1957 checklist, where the AOU changed 188 common bird names just that year and birders didn't have the luxury of an eBird update to help them remember those new names. 
So I know that this short event is not going to be enough and that just because it ends doesn't mean things are fixed. So please keep the conversation going. A conversation that is not just about nomenclatural technicalities, historical biographies, or even potential new names. It's ultimately about who we are as a community and how much we value diversity and inclusion. Learning and discussing more about that is what you can do for this cause in our community. So join us in asking questions and listening and learning. There's the Bird Names for Birds website with info, resources, and new bios regularly posted by Alex and Jess. The four of us and Bird Names are on social media. We're here with you. And the final thing I'll say, it's just a heartfelt thank you. Thank you to the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for hosting this event. Thank you to the other panelists and the audience. I genuinely appreciate everyone attending and engaging today because you are the bird community and I'm grateful to be among you and the birds. Thank you so much, Jordan. Really appreciate that. Um, and then last, we have our two fellow uh, naturalist illustrators. So first we'll hear from Ken and then David. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Jose. Um, lots of great uh, discussion today. Uh, for the sake of science and conservation, it's important to have standardized bird names at any given time. The names themselves don't have to be great. A red cockaded woodpecker is named for a tiny patch of feathers that's really hard to see, but that doesn't matter. We can mention that bird biologists or landowners or government agencies, and everyone knows what bird we're talking about. So it's good to have a set of English names that's standardized at the continental level at any given time. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, long-term stability in names is far less important. I mean, I started birding as a little kid in the 1960s, and there have been so many changes since then in names. That's just part of what happens in this field. Long-term stability is an illusion anyway. I mean, the eponyms we're discussing most of them have been in use for considerably less than 200 years. Now that, that's not really long-term. There are probably uh, Native American names for a lot of these birds that were used for a much longer time than that. So, now I'm looking at this um, from the angle of how name changes affect field guides. Um, with my own field guide to North American birds, the last complete update was in 2005. And of course there have been many cha name changes since then, but uh, even though uh, my publisher, Houghton Mifflin, they're a commercial publisher, but the books are printed directly from digital files that I send to them. So it's easy for me to make changes. Uh, in 2015, for example, the scientific name of white-tailed hawk changed because it was moved to a different genus. So I just changed that on that text page. Uh, I send the digital files for those pages to the publisher. The next time they have to print more copies of the book, they just insert the new pages into the file. We don't advertise it as a new edition because it's not, but it makes the book more up to date uh, in terms of names than what the copyright date would imply. So these name changes are just black ink changes and they're not a big deal. But when you change English names, you do have to cross-reference the new names to the old ones, at least for the first couple of decades to help people navigate. So in the field guide, in the text, or preferably in the species header, I would have to indicate that say this this glacier merlet was formerly called Kitlitz's merlet. Now that can be a challenge if it's a compact pocket-sized guide because space on the page is so limited anyway. Um, it'll be more of a challenge in the Spanish language edition of my field guide because I already cross-referenced the Spanish you know, from Spanish to English names. So things could get crowded with additional names, but I can work it out. Um, now this, um, Adding, uh, changing a bunch of English names makes more of a difference in the index because you have to cross-reference there as well. And it may take a couple of lines each time. Like, like say, uh, Sapsucker Williamson, C, Montaigne Sapsucker, page 216. So if we replaced all the eponyms, it would make the index in my guide up to two or 300 lines longer and it would take an extra page or two. Now, none of that is really a big deal even for print. And with apps or online guides, it would be even easier to handle. So logistically, I don't see this as being any kind of an obstacle. On a purely personal level, I see the value of dropping all these eponyms. If I'm, if I'm birding with a couple of black friends in Georgia, for example, we see a backman sparrow. 
you know, we're all aware of the fact that John Backman wrote some really ugly things in support of white supremacy. Now, the nominate race of that bird used to be called Pinewood Sparrow, and Backman's was established as the name for the full species less than 70 years ago. Well, why not just change it back? And beyond that, if we tried to parse all these historical figures saying, okay, well, Casson was good, but Townsend was bad, et cetera, that could go on forever. And I know uh, a couple of people have suggested doing this in stages, but I think rather than nibbling away at the problem, I'd like to see a talented and diverse committee that would tackle all of these eponyms at once. They could come up with alternatives, spend a lot of time getting buy-in for them from the larger community, and then establish a long lead time to a date when we had flipped the switch and adopt all of these new better names. Uh, since I've been, I've been birding for 60 years and I've been a member of the AOS for more than 30, so I guess I'm one of the old timers now, but frankly, this sounds good to me. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge some much younger people, uh, Robert Driver, Jordan Rutter, and Gabriel Foley, for helping to educate me on this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Really appreciate that. And then next up is David. Hi. <clears throat> um, let me get this up. So, well, thanks. I. Uh, um, it's funny that I've ended up at the end. The comments that I wrote are are more general, <laughs> more basic to the whole premise of this event. Um, but I wanted to. I'll start by thanking the committee for putting all this together and and echo Ken's comments to Jordan and the Bird Names for Birds gang that. Uh, you opened my eyes to this whole issue. Um, and uh, so I, you know, like Ken, I've been birding for a long time and seen a lot of name changes. And I, I remember being young and just starting birding, learning strange new names like Scoter and Ferruginous and Tohi. And quickly as I memorized those names and connected them in my mind to the birds they represent, each name became simply a string of syllables that would pop into my head when I saw or heard that species. The names basically lose all their meaning and words like pectoral sandpiper or Hammond's flycatcher become just comfortable and familiar links to that bird. Um, the best bird names help us remember the species. My favorite is red-winged blackbird, but you know exactly what that is. People will describe, hey, I saw a blackbird with red wings. And, um, and eponymous bird names like Hammond's flycatcher tell us nothing about that species and simply have to be memorized, but that's not necessarily reason enough to change them. Many of the names that we use all the time are essentially meaningless or even misleading. Um, take Shark Shinned Hawk, Connecticut Warbler, um, Evening Grosbeak, which was actually named because the first few specimens collected were actually shot in the evening. Um, but they still work just fine as names. Um, names are labels, as others have said, and, and pretty utilitarian. They just help us classify things and then communicate about those things, whether we're talking about H1N1 virus, a Phillips screwdriver, or any kind of bird. And in that way, stability is one of their key attributes. It's important that everyone uses the same name for the same thing year after year, but names also need to be free of baggage so that we can use them without distraction. Um, as I've learned more about eponymous bird names over the last year, it's become clear that these names carry a lot of baggage. Many of the people honored in bird names were actively involved in the oppression, enslavement, or even killing of people of other cultures or were pursuing inherently racist studies like phrenology and eugenics. And all of them benefited from the white supremacist views and European colonial advance of the times. Um, I think it's important to stress that I don't think of removing these people's names from bird names as any sort of retroactive blame or punishment or banishment of these people. I'm thinking about the present. Um, my main reason for supporting changing these names is simply respect. Uh, respect for all of the people whose ancestors were harmed by the white European society that early ornithologists were a part of, and also respect for the birds. 
Um, one of the things people point out in support of keeping eponymous names is that they offer an entry point and an opportunity to learn history. For me, these eponymous names were neutral until I learned more about their history. The more I learn, the more that history casts a shadow over the birds and name li names like Scott's Oriole or Hammond's Flycatcher don't mean just the bird anymore. They have baggage. Uh, if we cringe a little bit when we say or hear a bird's name, that's a barrier to communication. It's different from the free and uncomplicated flow of information that we can have when we talk about surf scoter or warbling vireo or yellow warbler. It's also a disservice to the bird. A bird should not be linked to any single person and should not have to carry a reminder of our own fraught history. And that's where I see the crux of this debate is between stability and respect. And the more I've learned, the more I come down on the side of respect. Being able to communicate purely about the birds without the shadow of history is more important than keeping all of the existing names. Uh, this won't be easy. It will take a lot of time and adjustment. As a field guide author, I can say that dealing with name changes in a book, as Ken said, is trivial compared to the other aspects. Um, the hardest part will probably be convincing the birding community that this is worth the trouble and education will be the key to that. It's a small step in the big landscape of racial and social injustice, but I think it's important and definitely worth doing. At least changing these bird names would allow people of all backgrounds to have simple and uncomplicated conversations about the pleasure of watching birds. Thank you so much, David. Um, Tahina, quick moment to pause to let everything that's just been shared um, sit in this space. As everybody has been speaking, there's also been an abundance uh, of variety and diversity of questions, which uh, we wanna acknowledge that as we move into that stage, uh, we're not going to get to answer all of them, and I think many of you, uh, for example, Jordan, I know you, you acknowledge how this is the, the smallness of this space isn't going to be enough for the enormity of, of this work, but I, I've heard how much different all of you um, have an appreciation for the progress and the component and understanding the commitment that would be ongoing. Uh, and thank you all for sharing from your perspectives as well on a um, personal note based on the professional work that I do, um, I think it speaks a lot of the ability for you all to both bring uh, different perspectives with a lot of overlapping commonalities uh, and frankly not shying away from of some of the language that can, can be uncomfortable for a lot of people when they think they hear it and it almost feels like it's not your language anymore. So things like colonization, white supremacy and so forth. And so for me, those are opportunities of engagement um, and I just want to acknowledge <laughs> that you're all as, a, as a, an extent example of the work that you're doing. So there's that component. Uh, our questions, we have some pre-submitted questions and then we also had uh, some uh, live Q&A right now, just for that everybody knows in terms of the process, uh, we, have, um, we have some amazing people working behind the scenes, furiously like going through all of the questions, trying to help to organize them. Uh, in all ways best possible. So some of the questions that I'm going to ask will not cover all, all, all the base and ranges, but as I invite a speaker to kind of answer a question, uh, as a reminder to all speakers, if there's an element that you feel, you know, you could add to it, um, please kind of add yourself in the queue. Um, and then also just, you know, if, if I, in any way I miss seeing you, just, you know, find a way to, 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 to make sure that, you, that I'm, you know that I'm not intentionally ignoring you. A lot of our questions also felt around a range of categories. Um, some of these covered, for example, uh, eponyms as an issue related to diversity and inclusion in our ornithological communities. Some of these covered a range around challenges and opportunities that come up with changing eponym bird names. Some of these covered a range um, around the role of public communication and, and education in eponymous name changes, um, uh, and then a few more. I also know that uh, many of you actually already answered some of these questions in, in, in what you were offering. So if I restate a question and it sounds familiar to something that you might have answered, that is not, um, 
me trying to trick any of you <laughs> or thinking that you you don't get another chance. It might just be an opportunity to add a little bit either more nuance, examples, uh, or context that you think might be helpful. Okay? Uh, so with that, I'm going to start with one question and um, invite, uh, let me just make sure I have the right person. I'm actually going to uh, invite Gregoria if, if you're here um, as well. Uh, one of the questions was, what are the challenges and opportunities of updating ep uh, eponymous uh, burn names? And I think uh, this was covered uh, in, in, in a different context, but love to kind of hear your take on it as well. Thanks, Jose. And it's Gregoria, like Mariah, um, actually. But yeah, so I think there's a lot of opportunities in changing bird names. Someone alluded to this earlier, but descriptive bird names are so much easier for novice birders to latch on to. Um, I work for the National Audubon Society with a lot of our chapters, and when they bring in new birders, hearing something like a stellar jay doesn't stick with them, but they know that punk blue jay, and they, they love that with a black crest, and they can remember a little bit more if we had a more descriptive name there. Um, so I think that's a big one. I also think there's the opportunity to learn a little bit more about culture. You know, I saw some questions about indigenous names. Obviously, in the continental U.S., there was a lot of overlap on both in species ranges and who lived where. So it would be really, really difficult to pick one indigenous name for one species, say, um, say a crow or something like that, that has such a wide range. But I do think, you know, there is an opportunity that if it's somewhere like Hawaii, as has been mentioned, and there's been an indigenous name for a long time there, um, for everyone to learn a little bit more about the culture and history of that bird from the Hawaiian perspective, if we return to things like the Kiwikui. Thank you so much. And I appreciate that correction, Gregoria. Like Mariah, I appreciate that. So I want to make sure that I honor your name as best possible. So thank you for that. Um, and in addition, Jordan, I believe you had, um, you might have had a few more points to add in terms of this question. Yeah, I just want to help everyone out, like get excited about the possibilities and all of the like cross divisional, multi dimensional, all of the different, you know, basically departments in a college, like they can all get involved because we're all going to be learning these names at the same time. We remove some of that competitive turn off feeling of birding and ornithology by having this, right? Because I'm, I'm just going to, I know uh, Ken is very humble, but you know Ken is this amazing person that's kind of intimidating because I know he knows a lot about birds and he has a really big life list, right? And who am I? I'm just humble Jordan, right? Well, if I know that he's learning new stuff the same time I'm learning new stuff, that's kind of cool, right? And it's a lot more accessible, um, especially for people that are just picking up a pair of binoculars or a college student that's just getting interested in the ornithology path today, right? So there's, a, there's that basic opportunity ahead of us. There's also the opportunity for us to have, so I'm a professional communicator and talking about birds like Bachman Sparrow are really challenging because it looks like another sparrow. Why should someone that doesn't think it's super cool care about this, this near threatened species, right? Well, if we could all get excited about, you know, we have to do this community education aspect to this campaign for it's now the most awesome sparrow instead of a sparrow that represents a Lutheran pastor that talked about white supremacy, then that's really cool too. And maybe we can do really cool art and storytelling and get the community involved and talk about, again, the threats and conservation needs that birds have. Maybe we can talk about some of the stories and experiences that um, the bird community members that aren't represented today have with this bird and all of the other ones. I just think that it's exciting what our future could be especially because I think the biggest opportunity is that this could be our chance to have a concrete statement, say the tendrils of all social justice have reached to the point of bird names and we're gonna do something about it. No, it won't end racism, it won't fix colonialism, but it's something that we can do right now today as our community. And the bird community is so big. The impact of this could be massive. And we're not the only ones. Coincidentally, this is happening for rock climbing routes. Deb Holland had introduced legislation for different landmarks like lakes and mountains. Let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs>
Thank you, Jordan. Um, and Gabriel, I wasn't sure if you wanted to add, uh, add anything there as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, and there's another question around, um, and this came up, I think uh, several of you mentioned this, this idea of stability. So here's a question, uh, Marshall, for you, if you don't mind tackling it first. And the question is, scientists are constantly learning new things about the natural world. If scientists are equipped to cope with changing hypotheses, understanding of phylogenetic relationships and scientific Latin names, even genera that affects many species, does scientific or nomenclature stability even exist? It's kind of like a philosophical undertone almost. Sure, thanks. Uh, one thing that I think is important to say is that the whole system of scientific nomenclature really doesn't promote stability. Um, it's really helpful to have names that match up with taxonomy that you know, when you use the name Eastern Toei, you're talking about the Eastern part of what used to be Rufus Sided Toei when Spotted Toei refers to the Western part. But the rules in the scientific nomenclature require that the scientific name stays the same. Um, so it's really powerful when you have common names that can be paired with those scientific names. And it really like adds to the value of the common name that that, that common name, scientific name pairing is actually unique. That I can actually talk about Eastern Toei and Spotted Toei and get across which population I'm talking about versus if if the English name carries down um, the way it did with Winter Wren, um, then you get confused about are you talking about the pre-split or post-split version. Um, so I, I think it's helpful to acknowledge like that important side of, of common names and sort of how that um, how that actually can sort of bring stability to the actual concepts that we're talking about. Thank you so much, Marshall. Um, and a bit related to that, because I, I myself, so I'm an immigrant from Mexico, and so English is like my, my second language. And so some of these questions actually come around this idea of multiple languages. Um, and so uh, Jeff, uh, the Baron, we'll, 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 I'll start with you, but I imagine others might have a few things to add. There's a few kind of questions around this idea of of uh, more kind of multiple uh, languages. So for example, um, you know, are there examples of what we're doing in terms of, the, of, of what does this look like with more uh, languages? Um, how do we navigate the complexity of English names in the context of, of multitude of names in other languages? Uh, do most languages have a common name for every species of bird? Like what are your, your thoughts around that? It's a really challenging question, Jose, and a great one. It's um, especially for birds that are fairly common and are quite common and very widespread, then there are potentially many, many um, indigenous or, or multilingual names for these species. Um, just, you know, sticking with the, with the English names versus uh, indigenous names locally um, on, in this continent, I think the, the real challenge is if we were going to go with the indigenous names, it's great in Hawaii because basically there, there's only pretty much one indigenous name for each of those species in Hawaii. But, um, you know, for a bird like a blue jay or an American crow or something like that, um, or Stellar's jay, you know, how, how would we ever choose which indigenous name to give to that species, given that there were probably many, many, many of them. And um, so I think the, the, the best thing that we really need to think about for these species is for species like that um, in particular are um, what is the best non you know, eponym to give to that bird that represents something important about its appearance or behavior or biology um, or um, you know, a place where it actually is uh, you know, important that the, you know, a, a location that's important for the species. So um, it is a real challenge for, I think indigenous names would be great for a species that um, is, is very localized. Um, but like when the, the duck formerly known as Old Squaw, um, they chose to, re to rename that long-tailed duck because that was the name that was used in the, in the old world. In the, in the British, uh, you know, the BOU used long-tailed duck for that. One of the Native American names was Kalu because it's, you know, it's somewhat, you know, similar to the way the birds call when they're courting. But I don't, there must have been probably other indigenous names for that species as well. So I think we just have to be really careful when we're proceeding um, and, and think carefully about, about the, you know, the way we choose new names. Thank you so much. And I know Marshall, you also have a, a couple of thoughts and then Alex, I, I see you after that as well. 
Sure, yeah, I, I just wanted to be able to sort of explain how, how eBird deals with this um, because we're really trying to, um, you know, bring, bring this global data collection system to everyone around the world. And we really wanna bring, um, bring people together, you know, across, across borders and across language barriers. So eBird actually uh, supports 47 different languages for bird names um, with an additional 37 regional variations and 14 different versions of English. So that lets birders in the UK see the name gray plover on their life list and birders in the US, if they prefer it, see black-bellied plover. Um, just next week, we're gonna add Marathi, which is a Southern Indian language, Greek, Persian, and customized versions of Portuguese for the Azores and Madeira, just so people have these you know, locally relevant um, emotional attachments to the birds. Um, so that so that they they're interacting with eBird using the names that are familiar to them and meaningful to them, um, and on the database side, it's just you know, it's just a just a switch you flip. Um, so the other piece of this that's been really exciting is I, I saw a question about you know do all languages have global bird names and and the answer is no, um, a lot a lot of them have local bird names. So so we've seen this evolution um, where we. We partnered with partners in Turkey to bring eBird to, to Turkey as eKushbank. Um, they provided names for Turkey and then they, they quickly expanded that to all of the Western Paleoarctic. And now we have a global set of Turkish names because as part of this global eBird community, a couple leaders within their group said, we, we really wanna provide names for all birds in Turkish so that anyone who travels um, has these handles that are in their familiar language. So it. It, we're really seeing a movement happen um, to uh, to really describe the world's birds across a lot of different languages, and it's really exciting. It also brings additional challenges here because a lot of those have been based on English names that have eponyms, and um, so it, it it shows kind of how far the tendrils of this movement may may reach. Um, not to say that it shouldn't. I appreciate that. Thank you, Marshall. Um, Alex. Um, yeah, sorry go. about that. Um, I, was just, I basically agree with all that's what's been said just then. Um, the one thing I would add is I think that by looking at sort of names of uh, indigenous cultures where these birds have been sort of like known for their entire history, although it might not be directly appropriate to like take them like, like for like, like say Stella's J, you wouldn't necessarily take an indigenous name for that because it would exclude other indigenous cultures. If there are like recurring themes within those names, um, like the same the same figure, the same sort of points and identification features are turning up again and again in different places, that might be a nice place to start looking at the kind of names that we could give these um, in sort of in the new English name, as it were. I'm not sure how I would raise my hand. I'd like to just add. It's something. okay. I appreciate it. This works. Go for it. Um, so one thing I should just point out, my first language is French and uh, French, um, one of the common practice is actually to use the scientific name as the basis for the French name. So eponyms are probably, I would say, I would sort of estimate probably at least twice as common as they are in English. So there's, there's certainly gonna be bigger challenges in some areas to sort of come up with you know, meaningful name for, uh, we, we do have a global list that covers all 10,000 plus species of all all birds in, in French, but um, I certainly sort of look at the challenge of how, how you know, coming up with 2000 new names uh, would represent and how long that might take and how much, uh, I mean, not all of these are named, are, are used in, in regions where French names are actually in use. So, you know, there's probably a, a big or smaller pool of people um, that would be directly impacted by changes, but it, uh, the scale of some of these challenges are probably gonna be bigger in some languages than they are in, in English for sure. Thank you, Danny. Uh, and I think one of the elements that I heard, Marshall, you mentioned how some of this can be like the flip of a switch, right? And I think uh, in the database component, and we had a couple of questions around for publishing. So I wanted to quickly uh, turn over to Ken and David. What are your thoughts um, in terms around this questions, or questions similar and related to this one? Um, particularly in this case, people were curing, were curious about what are the ramifications for those that are publishing various uh, books on birds? 
uh, do the publisher of those books, are, are they alerted to, to this movement? Um, and I guess the concern here, it'd be a shame to kind of like have just published a new edition and then finding out that then quote unquote the next day that a, a bunch of the names are no longer valid. And I think you spoke a little bit uh, to this, um, but I was just wondering if there's any additional context in terms of um, how you see it from that perspective as well. Okay, yeah. Um, well, any, uh, any kind of field guide or major reference work should have some experts involved, either as authors or consultants. And I'm not saying that there's some official group of experts that would act as the gatekeepers. In fact, I'm, I'm very much opposed to that idea. But a reference book is not going to have much value if it's not accurate, and it takes expertise to achieve that accuracy. So if you look at like major field guides, um, you know, for example, the National Geographic Guide, uh, John Dunn is the lead author and he's on the AOS checklist committee. So some change like this is not going to take him by surprise. And any publishers that are doing a conscientious job of putting together bird books, they're going to have people advising or consulting that would know that something like this was coming along. But this is another reason that if we take this on, it should be like a lengthy process of bringing in, you know, it, it should in, involve the input from a lot of different people uh, to get uh, community buy-in for the whole idea. Uh, so there'd be plenty of time for publishers to look ahead. And, you know, with range changes and taxonomic changes, bird books go out of date anyway. So there would be enough time uh, for publishers to uh, take this on. Can I add one more comment? Please, um, so, so one more thing that I, I think, I mean, regardless of the discussion around name changes and eponyms, there's already a somewhat big disconnect in some areas, especially around the world between field guides and, and citizen science effort. Like eBird is at the forefront of it, but it's not the only one. But um, often people use field guides as a reference to actually enter names. And then when they go to eBird, they're not finding these names. And it, that, that causes, creates a barrier for people to actually contribute data to science and conservation. And, and certainly that uh, over time, I would certainly hope that there's more coordination between sort of publishers and eBird uh, and other sort of citizen science to sort of, you know, talk a common language so that uh, we're not facing these disconnects where, you know, someone enters a black duck record in, in, in India because that's the name that they use for a bird that is, act is actually not related to American black duck. But um, so these types of challenges um, uh, would certainly be benefit from better coordination in, between publishers and data uh, people that work in conservation with data. Thank you. And David, I wasn't sure if you had a few plus to add as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So books and the books, books that are being updated or, or newly published um, should, as Ken said, should be aware of these changes. And that's something that whatever group gets set up to uh, consider and propose these changes should um, make sure that their their work is known so that anyone who has an interest will know that somewhere within months or or a year or something that a big number of changes are expected um, so it's not a surprise but I would say that the um, you know it's one thing for books that are being published now um, one, there's going to be a long kind of uh, transitional period. Well, <laughs> we'll go on. People still use bird books from 50 years ago. Um, and they're, they're, those books are already badly out of date in terms of names. If, if someone um, goes to uh, eBird and tries to type in a duck hawk, say they won't find a duck hawk. Um, so there, and that, that kind of issue, I think, is going to be the bigger challenge with the transition to a big number of new names is that um, if you go to a National Wildlife Refuge and pick up a printed checklist for the of birds of the refuge, or you find a book from five years ago that describes this, the common species of your neighborhood, um, that is going to be uh, have a bunch of obsolete names. So there, there will be in, in print, there will be a big transitional period. And a lot of people begin birding with old books and 
uh, it's just, I mean, it's, it's already, it's something that goes on now. This, what we're talking about is a bigger number of changes. So it'll be a little bit more, more dramatic, but that, that I think is the bigger issue with publishing in the transitional period that the books that are already in print now um, will be using a lot of names that are no longer current. Um, Thank you, David. So one of the things I hear how it's already kind of a feature of that process of publishing um, as it is, uh, so it's part of that consideration. And then uh, Jeff uh, Gordon, um, you were queued up as well. Yeah, I just wanted to very quickly say that I sort of said something about make the process of, you know, coming up with a new suggested slate of names public, but not too public. I didn't want that to come across as, um, you know, um, too exclusionary, but I really think there is, especially in this day and age, a balance that needs to be struck. And um, I'll just refer you to the famous uh, Bodie McBoatface um, example of um, putting things out too widely and publicly. Although Birdie McBirdface, I don't know, we could, we could vote on which species to assign that to. Anyway, thank you. No, thank you so much, Jeff. If, if anybody in the audience is completely unfamiliar with that, we encourage you to Google it. Um, that is both uh, met with a bit of seriousness in terms of uh, uh, very open, broad participation, as well as with some humor. So uh, again, if that's new to you, we welcome you to go ahead and Google that. Um, there's an also uh, a question in here, um, and then we'll jump into a little more of the questions that, that are being added right now. But there's a question around this idea of like, how, how does this impact uh, changes in conservation efforts? Uh, for example, specifically endangered species works. Uh, so how, what does that mean in general? And then I also saw a comment in terms of um, an example of if there are conservation efforts um, in which uh, names are kind of uh, essentially sold <laughs> or offered uh, to the funder, I guess kind of like, like naming a, a building. Um, and so you can wrap that in there as, as must be helpful, but I think the general question was, does this impact conservation efforts and specifically kind of endangered species work? Um, so I'll throw that open to um, to see if uh, Jody, you want to kind of tackle that one first. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think, and it's something I mentioned right off the right off the front. I think there is a conservation opportunity here. You know, like I think we all we all know the adage, and, and please correct me if I, if I don't know who who said it first. But you know, in order to start conserving something, you have to you have to care for it first, right? Um, and I'm not sure if that was Peterson who said it, but it's, but it's really true, right? We're at, we're at a point right now where, you know, for example, this past year with the pandemic, it brought so many new people into birds, into birding. Birds actually meant a lot to people right now. We've got uh, newer birders, we've got younger people, we've got more diverse people experiencing and seeing the joys of, of birds. And this is a big opportunity. It's an opportunity where, you know, we need to be breaking down barriers and we need to make birding more inclusive. And the, for me, the conservation opportunity is the more people we have out there from all different backgrounds and all more people out there experiencing the joys of birds, the more support we're gonna have to conserve birds, the more support we're gonna have to get people to participate in, in monitoring programs, the, the more people are gonna wanna donate to protect habitat or, or join organizations that are out there advocating on behalf of birds that there is a big conservation opportunity here and, I, and it really to me really stems from first identifying barriers and figuring out a positive way forward to break those down thank you jody and then alex i see you queued up um just to sort of add on to that i think there's a kind of like twofold element to the to the name of any species there's the sort of the scientific like um sort of uh filing system functionally um but i think when we're sort of engaging more with the general public like i do think there is a strong need for names that sort of evoke almost a sense of wonder in people when they're sort of first encountering birds then there needs to be something about that that just sort of makes them go oh that sounds cool i want to know more where like and there, I feel like equally there are some like non-eponyms which are not good at their jobs for that reason. Like 
they're just like oh it's not very exciting like uh, plain prinia comes to mind it's uh, that doesn't sell the bird but i think if you're renaming there there is that opportunity to sort of add that wonder to people coming into the field and that will hopefully sort of spill over into conservation and in just interest in general thank you so much alex um we have a couple more questions and I know we'll be nearing our end of time in a bit. Um, so for all other panelists, again, if, if there's an opportunity that you've noticed in terms of something we need to, we could further add on or haven't touched on, I'll invite you to, to, um, to communicate that out. There is another question that um, was here and I was curious, uh, maybe Jeff, LeBaron, you might wanna approach this one first. There's a question in terms of you know, do we consider renaming at the order and family level also? Would that require a more international forum? Um, this particular question was around finding it out that we still label things like old world and new world. And, and again, and knowing that, you know, approach this <laughs> from your perspective, knowing that you obviously sometimes can't speak for some of the entities and organizations and committees that aren't represented here as well. Well, I think the, and on some level, the I mean, the 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 families and orders of birds are uh, the the actual you know the 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 actual names aren't necessarily they're not um, they're not eponyms or that kind of thing. And it, but but you're right. I mean, in terms of the the old world, new world warblers um, and things like that, there are a few of them that we we could think about doing. But I think. On that level, um, it's it's not as much of an issue in terms of getting people involved and and you know what's the what's the name in their field guide or what's the name that they're seeing in eBird or you know on their Christmas bird count list. Um, so I think I think that um, our focus really at this point in time ought to be on on the you know we're starting with the English names. It certainly will end up being as a much more international thing. Um, once we do move, in, you know, into the global forum, or or further into Latin America, also, um, but um, most of the, the you know the family names aren't aren't as you know egregious as, as some of the other crazy English names that are out there. Thank you, and Denis. Yes, um, I, I may reiterate a little bit what I said earlier, but I, I think um, one of the like there's technological, like I'm mostly interested in sort of the, the practical aspects of how we do this. So once we've accepted that we're going to go forward and I, I don't know that we've necessarily landed on the approach, whether we go all in you know, all at once or we drive this on more longer. I think the one of the, the, the solutions or one of the ways by which we can increase the acceptability of this is to remove the barriers about how we do this. And we've touched on a few of these things where names don't line up with, you know, how you want to engage with them in terms of eBird. But there, there's definitely technical ways in which that can be facilitated. So if, you know, you use an old field guide, and I know Marshall and I have these discussions in the past where it wouldn't be great if you could an eBird and say, I'm using this version of the field guide, show me the names as they match the field guide. And if you had that sort of ability where you can interact in a way that makes sense for you, uh, then I think it removes some of these barriers and then, you know, then you start learning the new ones and maybe there's a way we can show both of them together uh, side by side and then eventually you transition. So the, the question is how do we make that transition um, as acceptable and smooth as possible um, and, and still continue to move forward on this objective of sort of, um, you know, recognizing the need for changing names. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to add a couple, two more points um, as we're um, continuing with some questions here. One is uh, um, all panelists, you you uh, you may all have an opportunity or ability to also see some of the questions that are being submitted that we may not get to. So Gregoria uh, modeled really well that if you're able to respond to some of the participants knowing that you can always follow up, that's an invitation. Um, just know that that's there and that we're as for all for all audience members know that we are collecting all questions as well. So they're not disappearing if you don't hear an answer as well. They were going to be curated intended in some fashion as well. So just um, taking that point. Before we jump into another question real quickly, uh, Marsha wanted to, to, to add, because I think you had a, a quick point to, to, to add as well. Yeah, I just sort of wanted to talk, return to the discussion about conservation impact and, and say that I, uh, what Jeff Gordon started with uh, really resonated with me that that the biggest risk to birds is is being ignored and how can this 
uh, be a process to get people excited about it. Um, I'm also conscious that within this panel, even though people people really seem to agree on, on a lot of the key points, um, there's been kind of like change them all at once mindset and definitely I advance the maybe we maybe we go slowly and methodically. Um, and as I think about that, I also really loved what Jordan said and kind of the the passion that she brought that was sort of sort of what I feel also that I wasn't able to express as well. But um, the notion of a campaign for Pinewood Sparrow and getting everyone excited about that bird um, to me is something that that takes time and kind of needs needs some oxygen and focus. And, and to me, that might be more effective if we sort of have these batches of like, you know, these bird names are changing and here's a chance to learn more about this bird. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm kind of grappling with like which of those would be more effective in terms of kind of the PR campaign that really should accompany these changes to both familiarize the whole community with, with the new name, why it changed, you know, learn more about the bird and use that as a driver for conservation. So. Thank you so much. Uh, Jordan, I see you in the queue. And then uh, after that, Danny and Dave, get ready, because there's a question that got upvoted uh, that I think has your name written on it. Uh, so Jordan, you're up. Well, I just thank you, Marshall, for those kind words. And the thing that I think you really tapped on, which hasn't been said yet, is the Three Billion Birds campaign, which was this international multi-organizational campaign to talk about bird conservation and the loss in population that is being experienced in the US and Canada. And that was incredible, right? This, it got global attention. Everyone in the US bird and uh, bird community and as well as Canada and others, you say 3 billion birds or bring birds back, people have some notion of what we're talking about, right? Could you imagine if we could do that again, but with bird names and it be this fun engagement activity? Like we have the capacity. This is all just about willpower. Um, and so I just want to say that, you know, we've done this. This whole group has done this in some capacity. And so really what this is about is just the conversation is starting. We're going to have so many things to figure out and uh, details and people to bring in and everything, but the conversation is starting and that's the most important thing. Thank you so much, uh, Jordan. So here's a question uh, that has received uh, quite a few comments and votes in our Q&A. So um, we have a couple of them, but this first one um, starts, can the panelists comment on any disruptions or negative impacts past name changes have caused? maybe especially BBS and BBL, since these panelists mentioned possible database issues. It seems that a few name changes happen each year, albeit mostly from splits or lumps rather than direct renaming. So these groups likely have processes already in place to handle this. So um, Danny and Dave, if you have uh, some thoughts, I think you mentioned a little bit on it, but maybe to like kind of highlight them a bit more. I can, uh, <clears throat> I can comment. Um... In the in the, in the um, BBL, honestly, I think the average bander is ahead of us with na with name changes. It hasn't really been a, a problem. Um, if anything, we get questions like, "When are you going to change the name of blah blah blah?" Because, as I mentioned earlier, our data entry program doesn't uh, loan itself to updates very well, and um, so I, I don't I can't say we've had any problem. With with uh, previous name changes. Yeah, and I'll speak to the BBS there. <clears throat> you know, as I had mentioned before, there's sort of the front end, which is the observer process in the field. And then there's the back end, which is how people come in to use your data. And when they come in to use your data, right? Um, yeah, I would say we've definitely seen a lot of cases where changes in English name have affected how people interact with the data and how they comprehend what they're really pulling out of the data set. Um, not everyone is really literate. I mean, it seems amazing, right? This is like one of these great things that a lot of us realize is that, you know, you want to become an ornithologist in your life. And then when you do, you can't find anybody who really identifies birds. I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious there, of course, but we all realize that birding is one thing and ornithology is something different. And so we think a lot of times that researchers who coming in for for bird data know as much as we do about um, the breadth of birding and the histories that have changed, taken place in the past. And it turns out that a lot of people who use 
bird data in really important ways for regulation and policy. They don't have that familiarity. And so, you know, we've re never really encountered a situation like we're in right now where we're changing English names for very important moral purposes. In the past, those changes have really sort of um, come down after taxonomic changes have occurred. And so things like yellow-bellied sapsucker, for instance, um, that bird, that English name has represented at least three different separate taxonomic concepts. And so when you go to retrieve um, breeding bird survey data, for instance, it's very important that you understand that because um, that has definitely had an influence on, on how the data have been partitioned in the past. Um, but yeah, as Danny said, you know, most of these things, they're, taxonomic changes happen, English names ha happen, you deal with it as best you can. You try to put as much information out there as you can to ensure the continuity. It's very much like road names. Road names change in time. And when you do historical work, looking at spatial stuff, you have to you know, do your homework to really make the connection. And you hope people who are in that line of business um, go the distance for you to try to share with you the information they have to, to allow you, who's not a cartographer, to make the, the link and the leap. Thank you, Dave. And I see uh, Jeff uh, LeBaron, you are queued up. Yeah, just a quick, uh, uh, you know, comment about uh, this type of thing in the in the CBC databases. We do uh, many moons ago. We actually kept in the database all the old names by which birds were were um, you know tallied at the time. So we actually have way back when there was a bird which was then called dusky warbler, which actually was an old name for orange crown warbler. And now that's still in the database because it got you know grandfathered in. Um, whereas that uh, you know, so people are now looking for you know, wondering why in the world do we have this old world warbler um, in the database that, that shouldn't be there at all. So what with the CDC, what we our goal is is to actually be able to update annually. Um, we can't do it right now because we're behind the, the the game also with with the our our, our species table. But um, our, our ultimate goal is to actually um, on on an annual basis to be able to update uh, the names that will incorporate all these new changes. Thank you so much. We have another very uh, popular high demand question here. And so uh, as a reminder to participants, any question you submit that we don't get to, it's being tracked and it doesn't just automatically disappear unless it falls outside of the guidelines that were stated at the beginning. Um, and then I'll read this question first and then uh, Kathy and Yusuf, I'll give you uh, first right of denial, if you will. <laughs> you can choose not to answer it, but I wanna give you an opportunity to just share your thoughts. Um, but if you feel it doesn't fall within your scope of like wanting to answer, you can just say, say pass. And then I'll invite any other speakers for whom this question sings to you. Um, let me know in the chat just to make sure or some, some visible way so that I can get to it. And so here's the question. The question is, if English eponymous names uh, are changed, what will happen to the scientific names? So for example, and forgive my, my Latin here, Asipiter cooperi, Cooper's hawk, um, and others that have the eponymous name, a species name, like Kirtland's warbler, Harland's hawk, Swinson's hawk, et cetera. Um, so that's the question. You also see it uh, written in the, the Q&A. So uh, Kathy and and then Yusuf, if you want to give that a try, and then we'll open it up to the panelists. Hi, it's Kathy here. Um, there different nomenclature, so it may not have an impact or it may have a large impact. It all depends if the scientific name community feels it's something to review as well. And I am not as um, knowledgeable on that. But I'm sure there's others on the, the panel now who could answer that more clearly. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Yusuf um, and then Ken. Yeah, I would I would defer to uh, Denis on that one, to be honest. No, all good. I appreciate that. <laughs> so um, let's see. Uh, well, Ken, you, you were up first. So let's have Ken and then uh, Denis uh, have you follow up. Oh, okay, yeah, I just wanted to point out that um, the rules for establishing and changing names are completely different when you're talking about scientific names. That's an uh, English name for any North American brood, a committee of the AOS can do that anytime for any reason. 
and scientific naming is done under really strict rules. A change in scientific name can only happen in specific circumstances, mainly involving a change in classification, including lumps or splits, or moving a form to a different genus, or sometimes a name will change because a scholar finds that an older name has priority or the supposed type specimen is actually of the wrong species, but these cases are really rare. And for borderline cases, there's a worldwide group called the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature that will hand down a judgment. So trying to change uh, eponymous scientific names would be many orders of magnitude more difficult and it would take a worldwide movement. Um, you know, obviously there is a problem here. You have birds all over South America, Africa and Asia that were named for dead white European men. And in the future, maybe someone will address this, but for the time being, um, I think we have enough to deal with with talking about English names and we should uh, avoid the, the scientific name question for the time being. Thank you, Ken. Vinny? Yeah, I, I don't think I can add much more to what Ken just said. I think my point was much the same, but I, I mean, there's obviously other issues that I think uh, Marshall has touched on with scientific names that ought to be addressed. I think it's a much, much bigger problem. I mean, there's a there's a really strict set of rules that, uh, that I think would have to be sort of undone that go well beyond birds. It, it covers all of biodiversity. So I, I think, um, I mean, uh, you know, there, it's a useful discussion to have. All, re all rules can be changed. And I think, you know, there may be a path forward where uh, maybe the I, uh, com committee for uh, nomenclature might actually decide to avoid sort of new names. Uh, so there may be a sort of a, a longer transition period where we can sort of extirpate ourselves from using eponymous names in scientific literature. But I, I think it goes well beyond what this group can achieve. Um, and I would agree that focusing on common names is uh, Thank you. And I think, place. yeah, I think I see that noted in terms of helping uh, with the scope, right, of the conversation. So I appreciate you all naming and sharing that, um, given it was an audience question. Um, I also see, um, Alex, you were queued up. Um, yeah, I mean, largely just to agree with that, um, but just to sort of like highlight that as it is, even within English, names aren't consistent, like between, say, the, like the UK where I am and US, like, uh, one that comes to mind is like for you, for all of you, you would know uh, boreal owl, but over here it would be a tengmalm's owl. And I think the underpinnings of scientific names kind of avoid that issue. And so while theoretically it would be nice to amend those, like that would be a, a way, way more Herculean task to actually achieve than just the English names, which can be sort of like done within a single jurisdiction. Thank you so much, Alex. And we are nearing the end, basically. Uh, so we'll have time for one more question. Again, I really appreciate the way that everybody answered that question, both in terms of it's something that panelists, uh, or excuse me, attendees really, really wanted your thoughts. And I appreciate how you also kind of frame in terms of the scope um, of, of, of both intent and capacity at the moment um, with this issue. So the last question that's here, again, I'll read it. And then honestly, I'll kind of have it open to see which panelists uh, you feel it calls to you the most, knowing that is um, our last question and we're close to the end. So um, our last kind of highlighted question here is, be interested to hear from panelists discuss whether the change movement needs to be all or nothing, as opposed to a process by which we remove many or most um, eponyms but allow some genuine heroes, perhaps including new ones, to be honored because of outsized influence that warrants the recognition. Let's see who wants to take that. I know several of you have spoken in, in some fashion um, to that, to a form of that question. Well, seeing nobody else, uh, Denis, uh, you're up, and then Alex. Okay. Well, I think um, I'm, I will echo what Marshall Wyleth was saying a bit earlier, that I'm really of two mind on this, on how fast we need to move. I think, um, on one hand, I think there's a value in just doing it and uh, sort of dealing with the, you know, giving ourselves a, a range to sort of deal with the, the transition and the questions that are surround sort of the, the transition. On the other hand, I think there's a value in sort of the 
the process of the discussion that needs to happen around name changes and and the, like trying to carefully convey why we're uh, we're engaging in this and sort of evaluate you know uh, sort of yeah like I think people uh, may respond better to sort of a, a more gradual process and and be more more excited about sort of you know it gives us an opportunity to say discuss this over the next decade um, maybe uh, I don't know like I I really have two mind on this. I, Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I mean, I would broadly be of the opinion that it's probably a sort of rip off the bandaid scenario. Like the less, it's it's going to be a major traumatic change to like how people interact with birds, like however you do it. And my gut reaction is that if you get it over and done with, you can get on with sort of what comes next. Um, I mean, I do think there are like cases where it's more complex. Um, I mean, there was in the sort of other questions, it was mentioned sort of what do we do with birds named American something, given it was named after Imerigo Vespucci with his own problematic history. I think like I think when it's sort of like filtered through a layer of geography, that becomes more complicated. Um, and those I, I wouldn't class as urgent because I think there's you can't just remove the word America from common lexicon because it's everywhere. Um, but I think for the most part, um, it would just make more sense to just um, get this sort of big change over and done with and so we can move on to what happens next. Thank you so much, Alex. And then for this one particular moment, uh, Jordan, you have the last word. Thanks. I just want to re-emphasize that we're a community and this event right now is our first step. We're going to have a bajillion steps ahead of us. But the thing is that if we commit to removing all eponymous names, that's the tip of the iceberg for the journey that we have ahead of us, right? Because the reason why I and Bird Names for Birds is saying all eponymous names is because the system is, is broken right now. And to some degree, it was built that way. So we wanna make sure that we have in all of our steps ahead of us, all of the community members that aren't on this panel right now. We wanna have all of the stakeholders, whether it's, you know, again, ornithologists, birders, people that just see birds casually. We want everyone here. We, we want a new table where everyone is here to talk about all of the birds moving forward. And again, I know it's gonna be a huge ask. I know it's gonna be so much work and a lot of time, whether we're talking about the actual change or, how many generations until we're all on the same page, but it's worth it because it's our community, right? It has to be everything because that's the statement that we are committing to. And that's what I hope comes out of this Congress is the commitment to keep taking those steps forward and figuring this out together. That, that is ultimately what this is about. Thank you, Jordan. And um, I really want to acknowledge the fact that you all shared so many solid points. And honestly, each of you could be devoted your own hour session, I think, in terms of your expertise uh, and your knowledge uh, and the perspective from where you're coming from, knowing that, again, I anticipate a lot many more opportunities. I appreciate the way that you all held space for each other. Uh, I saw that and acknowledged that through the chat as well as providing the space and, and awareness for that. So thank you for that because I think that's important in how you model this. Um, can you continue to uh, model this going forward? Uh, lastly, I think there's a lot of elements that, that really overlapped both in terms of the how you moved with this in the sense of urgency, um, the recognition of different processes at hand, the types of impact and considerations. So I think there was a whole a spectrum of around um, going that. And that ultimately, um, this awareness is a key step for moving towards action that you all provided filling in this component around like how much more do we need to know? Uh, and what does that ultimately lead, lead to in terms of the steps and actions that we take um, in terms of structural changes? And then at the end of the day, um, you're balancing and weighing both the opportunities with the challenges um, and being able to really kind of acknowledge uh, sometimes it's not just an easy either or, and yet ultimately it still relies on making a choice and a decision. So I'll close my component by saying thank you and gratitude uh, because 
um, you you had me flash back to a couple of years ago when I was doing an outing. Um, and again, as a novice birder, I was leading a group of, of Latino families and I, I could identify a turkey vulture. And um, I asked a, a fellow, a, a dad that was part of the strips, like, what can you tell me about that? He ended up giving me five different names in Spanish and to which I added, great, well, now we're gonna add one in English. And so you just had me this, this flashback of kind of the multiple perspective, the abundance, the engagement, the communication, um, ultimately how, what this means in terms of the effect and impact on data um, and so forth. So with that, I wanna say thank you so much. And I am gonna turn it over in terms of closing remarks from the DNI, DNI committee. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Jose. And I'd like to thank uh, everyone who participated. A very deep and heartfelt thank, thank you to all the participants from in the Congress. Thank you to our panelists who generously shared their time and perspectives during initial listening sessions, the lead up to the Congress, and during the Congress itself. And thank you to Jose Gonzalez for developing a thoughtful success agreement and for deftly moderating the event. Throughout the planning process, Jose has kindly and expertly advised us and we owe him a debt of gratitude. Thank you to all the attendees who listened thoughtfully, asked many probing questions and engaged in such complex, such complex issue within our community. We are, we are planning future opportunities to share your opinion of this event and bird names in general. For now, we encourage participants to share their thoughts through the same link we share for pre-event questions, which is available on the English Bird Names blog. As Jose mentioned, this is the first step of our longer journey, and we hope that all of you stay tuned and contribute to the next steps. Thank you to the AOS leadership for supporting the Community Congress from its inception as a constructive space for conversation about bird names. We really hope all of you take care and have a great weekend. Thank you.